Jesus of Nazareth. I saw what you did to the leper on the road this morning. My friend has been paralyzed since childhood. He has no hope but you. Please, do for him what you did for the leper. That's a rope! Put it back, man! If you are willing, Rabbi, I know you can do this. What you wanted? Get out your tablet at least. Harry! Is he in danger? I don't know. No, I don't think so. He's got women there? Yes. Can you believe we're really here for this? Yes. Down. did you teach? Answer me. If you are willing, Rabbi, you know you can't. Hey, I'm talking to you. By whom do you teach? Certainly not the authority of any rabbi from Nazareth. Where did you study? Your faith is beautiful. Son, take heart. Your sins are forgiven. Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God our own? Right. But I ask you, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up and walk? easy to say anything, no? But to show you, and so that you may know that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. I say to you, my son, rise. Pick up your bed.
That's right. We can, click, we can clap for that. He is good. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Um, I just picture in my mind those, those kids on the roof just cheering at you. And I just pray that we would have hearts like that, God. Pray that we would be astonished again at who you are. I pray that your word would just speak life and truth to us. I pray that we'd fall in love with Jesus again. Uh, we love you, Lord. Speak now. We are listening. And we come to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I love that scene. Um, just love who Jesus is. And it's our deep prayer here at this church that wherever you are in your story, that you would just come face to face and heart to heart with Jesus. So if you got your Bible, why don't you take it out or turn it on and uh, meet me in Matthew uh, chapter 9. And we're going to go after just this beautiful scene, okay? I love that scene because um, it highlights two concepts that we have been diving deeply into this church in the last couple chapters of Matthew. The authority of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus. Week after week, we've seen his authority. Week after week, we've just been astonished by the authority that Jesus shows. And so, for example, there was authority in the way that he talked, and the people were amazed. There was authority in the way that he healed. The people's lives were transformed. There was, there was authority in how he approached the spirit realm. He cast out demons, and people were set free. Over and over, it was, it was his authority that was just changing the world. And there was also this amazing compassion about Jesus. Have you seen that? Um, a few weeks ago, remember, we saw the leper, the untouchable leper who, who comes and he's like, nobody else cares about me. Nobody else will touch me. Like, I'm, I'm not wanted anywhere. But you, if you're willing, you can, you can make me clean. And Jesus is like, willing? I'm willing. And he reaches out his hand and he touches him. He says, be clean, and the leper is healed. And we just see his compassion. Um, or even last week, I loved last week. Um, if you're with us, remember, um, Jesus is in this massive crowd. Everybody's like, I want to follow you, Jesus. I want in, Jesus. And he's like, actually, my heart is beating strong right now for these two guys that are across the sea. And he grabs his disciples. They jump in a boat, and they weather the storm, and they go across the sea. Remember this? And, and he casts out these demons and sets these two people free that were like these crazy zombie-like freak show, like living in the tomb, guys. He cared about their freedom. And then he gets back in the boat, and he comes back. And we just see his compassion over and over and over again. And today, let me just kind of prepare you for where we're going to be today in Matthew chapter 9. We are going to see the authority of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus just merge together in this beautiful way. And in this story, just to prepare you, there is going to be an aspect of what it means to follow Jesus that maybe you've never considered before. And I'm going to look you in the eyes and I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to encourage you that this part of the faith that we're going to see in this text would just be um, a theme of our lives here at this church. I, I think I say this almost every week. We're not here just to play church or to put on a church show so that you can like sit in a crowd and we can say, are you entertained? Like that's not what we're about here, okay? We are into following Jesus Christ boldly, passionately, and following him like he asks us to follow him. And we're going to see something today that will be just stunning. So if you got your Bible, why don't you meet me in Matthew 9. And uh, why don't we do this? Would you stand with me? Uh, just in reverence of the, our Lord. Let's, let's stand in reverence of God. And let's read his words, okay? Matthew 9, 1 and following. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. Behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise and walk. 
but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God who had given such authority to men. These are the words of God. May he speak to us boldly. You may be seated. Matthew chapter 9, one of my favorite scenes. Let's just kind of unpack what's going on. Um, I know you've heard this story. I know you just watched this story, but let's, let's dig into it just a little bit, and let's see if we can kind of draw out some of the details that are amazing details. First, I want you to picture a little lakeside town called Capernaum, okay? This was a small little village. It was the kind of village that you pretty much knew everybody in town. It took just a few minutes to walk across it. I've been to this place a couple times. It is not big. It is not impressive. It's not bigger than this YMCA. I mean, it is like a small little town, and you can look out, and you can see the sea, okay? And Jesus was at this town, okay? And the last time he was at this town, he shook the village. Hold on to that thought for a moment, okay? He's in this little town of Capernaum. And I want you to picture a home. And when I say a home, you got to picture ancient world, first century Middle Eastern home. Not like, you know, uh, a great room and a kitchen with a breakfast nook and 2.5 bathrooms and like a big, like, don't picture that. You need to picture Middle Eastern ancient world home, which would have been one story, mud sticks, little stones. It would have been one story with a flat roof, beams across the roof, mud tiles, like sticks, tile, like little tiny home. You got everybody with me? And the home would have been packed. All right. A crowd like you wouldn't believe is trying to cram in this tiny little home. And, you know, the question to ask is why? Like, like why is everybody in this home? Last time Jesus was in Capernaum, which, by the way, was last chapter, if you've been walking with us, Jesus shook the town, okay? And let me show you. I like this verse in Mark chapter 1. It's describing the same scene. Um, This is happening the last time, just, just a few days earlier, when Jesus was in Capernaum. This is Mark 1, 32 through 33. Watch this. That evening at sundown, They brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. So, I mean, just picture that. Like, knock, knock, knock on the door. Who's here? Oh, it's everybody. Like, like literally, it's everybody. The whole city. And Jesus healed everybody that was sick. Jesus cast out every demon. He freed everybody who was oppressed. And then, next day, Jesus gets in a boat, crosses, comes back, back to Capernaum, and like, word, I imagine, spread like wildfire. He's here. Like, what would you do, for goodness sakes? Like, if Jesus is teaching in that house, you would be there. You would cram into that house and hear him preaching the word. You'd do whatever you could to be in the presence of Jesus. I know I would. And Luke, who also describes this scene, says basically this. He says, not only was there this crowd of people there, but literally every Pharisee, scribe, teacher of the law, religious elite, were coming from all over. It says in in Luke, from Judea, from Galilee, from Jerusalem. They were like, there's this new teacher in town, and he's shaking things up. We got to see if he's legit. And some were mad at him. Some were jealous at him. Some were like, like, we need to shut him up. They were like, we need to go and we need to kind of skeptically listen to Jesus. So I want you to picture this crowd where there is everybody cramming together saying, we want to hear him. We want to be healed by him. And there's all these religious authorities like, and we want to kind of skeptically make sure he doesn't say anything wrong. And then somebody else entered the crowd. Obviously, you've seen this, but let me just tell you what happened, okay? Let's look at Mark for this. I love how Mark describes this scene. Uh, Mark chapter 2. And when he returned to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. 
and he was preaching the word to them. Now watch this. I think this scene is hilarious. So I don't think you can miss kind of the humor of what's happening here, okay? And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. Okay, so, so they get to the home. And I have no idea how this conversation went down, but, but kind of in my mind and the hilariousness of how this must have happened, like, like, I, like was this plan A or B or C? I mean, like, how did the guy, like... They get there, and they're like, obviously, there's a big crowd. We're not going to wait. And then s- one of them must have been like, light bulb idea. Let's just climb up over the roof, rip off the roof, and lower, swing him down in there, I guess. Like, that's our best. And somehow, these guys, these five people are like, let's go. Let's do it. And for some, nobody else thinks that's hilarious. I think that is hysterical, like, Our best option, I think, is to rip off the roof and to lower him down in an ancient world gurney on his bed into the presence of Jesus because we know his authority and his compassion. And of all things I want you to see, I want you to hold on to this and hold on to it for later. This was a group of friends that said, we will stop at nothing to get our friend to the presence of Jesus. We will do whatever it takes. Let me say that a second time. We will do whatever it takes to get to the presence of Jesus. And they did. And I want you to see how this scene unfolds. Like, put yourself, like, put yourself ancient world in the spot, okay? So Jesus is teaching, and he's, he's teaching them, and he's in the middle of his sermon, and suddenly, like, there are distractions like you wouldn't believe because they look up, and, like, scraping sound, chunks of mud, like, sticks falling on the ground, like, surely somebody's not ripping off the roof. And I imagine if you were the owners of the house, you're like, wait a second, that's my roof. And then, like, it literally a hole opens up, Man on ropes in his bed comes swinging down into the presence of Jesus. I think you would have been annoyed at the distraction, wouldn't you? And and, and not only is it obviously distracted, throwing Jesus off his whatever train of thought he was in, but if you are one of the religious authorities, there's also this little sort of pervasive lie thinking that was present in that day and age that I just want to expose real quick. Um, Jesus takes this thing that they thought, and a few stories later, he destroys it and says, that's not true. But in the ancient world, there was this messed up way of thinking amongst the religious elite that if you were diseased or paralyzed in any way, you earned it. Like it was your sin or it was your parents' sin, it was somebody's fault, and you got what you deserved. So for the religious leaders to be like, we're listening, we're scrutinizing Jesus, distraction, roof, uh, like mud falling, and what? It's a paralytic? Like, like we're annoyed and we're frustrated that he is interrupting us. He deserves what he has. He's not even worthy to be in the presence of this rabbi. But again, you've got a group of friends that are like, we'll do whatever it takes. And I want you to picture the scene, okay? Because it's unbelievable that Jesus feels the distraction, hears the sound, sees like the annoyance, sees this man lower down, pauses in the middle of it, looks him in the eyes, opens up his mouth and says, I forgive you. Like, what is that? Like that, like, that is a stunning statement. That, that is the statement that you wouldn't have expected. For goodness sakes, these guys are like, we're doing whatever we can do to get him to the presence of Jesus. We'll rip off a roof and lower him down because the primary area of his life, the goal of our hearts right now, is this man needs to be healed. They knew he needed to be healed. Everybody in the crowd knew he needed to be healed. But Jesus sees the scene, like hears the sound, discerns exactly what's going on, and he's like, actually, primary need of this guy's heart. I care about his body, but let me go primary first. I care about his heart. And 
I want him to be in a relationship with God. And he looked into his heart and his life and he said, let's deal with this first. Your sins are forgiven. Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. And we're going to unpack that a little bit later. But I want you to know that, that as this scene kind of blows up from there, let me give you a, a little bit of an outline of what I see going on in Matthew. Let's go back to Matthew, okay? Jesus is going to have something about the way he speaks, something about the way he sees, and something about the way he heals, okay? There'll be something about the way he speaks, something about the way he sees, something about the way he heals. It will all point to one common theme, okay? So let's just kind of unpack it. Let's go back to Matthew, Matthew chapter 9, and um, I want to show you this first, verse 2, watch this. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven, okay? Let me illustrate this. I um, hope this is not a newsflash to any of you, but... Um, my wife and I, who I love deeply and am fully committed to, we do not have the perfect marriage, okay? And as a pastor and as a wife, like, we fight. We fight. Like, we go through things. We, we hurt each other. We, we offend each other. We get in these little, and, and then we make up because we're highly committed to each other, and we're highly committed not to let there be an offense and kind of shelve it away and pretend it doesn't exist, Okay, so when I hurt my wife, which I often do, I go back to her after spending time before the Lord and feeling God's conviction and realizing I was wrong. I go back to her and I say, Ashley, I'm so sorry. I did this. I offended you. I was rude. I shouldn't have said that. Shouldn't have done that. Will you forgive me? And what she says is, yes, I forgive you for offending me. I forgive you for what you've done against me. Here's what she has never said in her life. David, your sins are forgiven. And the reason that she doesn't say your sins are forgiven is because she doesn't have the authority to do that. If she were to say, David, everything you've ever done, every like thought you've ever had, every, every sin, every action, every attitude are forgiven, it would imply that she has the authority and everything I've ever done is an affront to her. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. And there's this implication that he knew, the religious leaders knew, everybody knew, okay? The one who can say that is God. Because God created the world. God owns the world. God is holy. We are sinful. And every sin done on this earth is an affront to a holy God. For God to say, your sins are forgiven. Here's, here's the point, ready? He was speaking like God speaks. He was speaking like God speaks, okay? And let me, let me pause on that because I, I don't want to miss the obvious point, but the main point, okay? So I, we try to say something like this every week. Let me say it again, okay? God loves you and wants to be in a relationship with you. And I believe that there's some people in this room or watching online right now that have bought the lie like, when God thinks of me, he's ashamed of me. And, and my guilt is too great. My, I've gone too far. And the way that God views me is like dirty and gone. And I can, I can be in church or I can watch this, but, but, but I can't be deeply connected to God. Look at me. That's a lie from hell. He loves you. He's not ashamed of you. He wants to be in a relationship with you. And he's paid the price on the cross to forgive you. And one of the greatest passions of Jesus Christ is to look you in the eyes and to say, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Take heart, my daughter, your sins are forgiven. I've paid the price. You can be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you know that? Like he loves you and he wants to be in a relationship with you. And if you want to place yourself in the story, you're the dude on the gurney that needs the forgiveness of Jesus and you can have it. He loves you. You're not too far from God. You're not too far from God. He loves you. And he has forgiveness for you. But God, right there, Jesus was speaking like only God could speak. 
and everybody knew that. Everybody knew that he was claiming God's authority. And that's why the religious leaders were like, whoa, w- wait. And deep inside their heart, they were saying, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. By the time out, blasphemy, the definition of blasphemy, um, in the ancient world, that was the, the, the highest sin that you could do. It was considered an affront against the holiness of God. It was, it was claiming for yourself something that only God can do. It was, it was calling out that the work of God is actually the work of someone else. Blasphemy, the, the penalty for blasphemy was death. And they inside their hearts were saying, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. This is blasphemy. And Jesus, I love this scene, he just pauses and he, he does something. Did you notice this? He's like, hey, why, why do you speak evil in your hearts? Can I have the next slide? Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? Not only was Jesus speaking like only God could speak, but he was doing something else. He was seeing like God sees. All right? Outside of the miraculous move of God and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, normal human beings can't look and discern inside a human heart, okay? That's a God thing. And so we got all these verses throughout the Old Testament. Like, for example, um, we have this David in, in the Psalms says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, oh God, my, my rock, my redeemer. Implication, God, you see and discern the human heart. You know my heart, okay? Book of Proverbs, there's a proverb that says many the paths of a man are right in his own eyes, but God discerns the heart, okay? God, who sees our hearts, who knows your heart, can look and weigh the motives of the human heart. And Jesus in this moment is like, yeah, not only am I speaking like God, let me call out exactly what's going on in your heart. He sees like God sees, okay? And then not only that, I, ju- I just love this, He's like, this is what he says next. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. He knew their thoughts, and he's like, hey, by the way, which one is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? Implication, both of them are impossible outside of God but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to do what only God can do. He healed like God heals. He's like, I've got the authority to heal the heart. I've got the authority to heal the body. Watch this. Rise and walk, okay? He spoke like God spoke, saw like God saw, healed like God healed. And there's one more just sort of authority thing that you need to see that you might have missed, but it's the great treasure of this text. When you just read it quickly, you might miss this. You might miss the title that he claims for himself, which is the most consistent title that Jesus ever claims for himself. In the book of Luke, he says it 26 times. Okay? I want you to see this because if there's one, like, phrase that made the Pharisees lose their mind, this was the phrase. So if you got a Bible, flip over to Daniel chapter 7. I want to read this to us. Daniel chapter 7. Just to set you up, uh, Daniel was a prophet in the Old Testament. He was a leader um, to the people of Israel. When they were in captivity in Babylon, three times a day, he he got on his knees in front of it in in his home and lifted his like, like body so that everybody could see, and he prayed to the Lord. Okay, Daniel was this awesome guy. And one day Daniel was praying to the Lord and he had this vision of all of eternity and kind of the throne of God and what God was doing. He had this beautiful prophetic vision. And, and it's bold and it's awesome and it's memorized by Jewish theologians. It's part of our faith, so I don't want you to miss this, okay? The vision of the Ancient of Days, Daniel 7, verse 9 and following. As I looked, thrones were placed. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. 
His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames. Its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. Let's just pause there for a moment. Daniel has a vision of God and the throne of God in all of eternity. And, and how do you describe this scene? I mean, I think, I think words kind of fall short. He's like, you want to know what God looked like? I mean, it was like white, pure white, ha- head like white, hair like white. And there was fire. There was like fire coming out of him, like fire before a throne in 10,000 times 10,000 people around, which is a number mani- meaning you can't get your mind around this number, was around the throne. Do you have that scene in your mind? And then someone approached the throne. Look at this. This is verse 13 and following. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Okay, so somebody approaches the throne of God, and who is it? It is one with the title, the Son of Man. And I don't know if you caught this, but he comes floating on clouds. And to this Son of Man, okay, we've been talking about this word authority. Remember, authority has concepts like power and position and possession. Like who has power? Who has position over all? And you want to know the greatest, one of the greatest statements of authority in the Old Testament? It's right here. Whoever this Son of Man is who comes floating on the clouds, how big is his kingdom? Well, it's, it's the whole world. Who is over his power? It's every people, nation, and language. His dominion, his kingship is everlasting. Whoever the Son of Man is, nobody argues on this one, is considered the most authoritative being in the universe. His authority is equal to God. Do you sense the significance of that? So Jewish theologians all throughout time are like, who is the Son of Man? Like, who, who is this figure of the Son of Man? We get to this scene, back to the scene, packed house, little first century house, rip off the roof. Dude gets lowered down on a bed. Jesus is like, yeah, I see that. I'm calling out what's in your mind. I'm speaking. And by the way, you want to know, like, like main point here, so that you would know that, and what phrase does he use? That the Son of Man has authority. And they would have lost their minds. And he healed them. And what happened is is what you would expect. The people were afraid and everybody worshipped. They had a holy fear and holy worship. Isn't that beautiful? And so let's jump out of this story and let's jump into our lives. Okay, I have a primary application and I have a secondary application. Okay, primary application of Matthew chapter 9. Can we go back to Matthew chapter 9, verse 1 through 3? Primary application that, that, that God would want us to hear, and it's the same thing that we've been walking through week after week after week after week, it's this, okay? If Jesus has the authority over everything on earth, and if Jesus' authority is over every tribe, language, nation, and tongue, and one day 10,000 times 10,000 will bow before the throne worshiping him. I hope this isn't like a, like a news flash idea, but here's, here's how we should respond, basically. Jesus, you can have authority over my life right now. Jesus, one day when, when there'll be millions and millions and billions around your throne worshiping you and proclaiming you as Lord of all, What would make most sense in my life now is to live like your Lord of all. If one day you'll be the biggest deal in all of eternity, let me not make life about my story. Let me not live for my stuff. Let me not make this very American way of thinking that that my dreams, my goals, my stuff, my retirement, my, my 
contemporary like dream that I want to live becomes the driving force of my heart and Jesus and following him is secondary. Let's make following Jesus primary and everything else of way less important because one day it will not matter. Please don't read the Gospels and miss the primal call of Jesus to say, follow me. Nothing else will one day matter. So we got to keep looking at our life saying, do we live like that or do we not? Do we live like that or is that just like a pretty little concept we paint on Sunday? Follow Jesus with everything, okay? But there's a secondary application. I want you to know that as I sought the Lord and as I asked just the Spirit of God to stir up within me, God, what would you want said to our church this week? I really feel like God brought me to something um, that I really feel like he needs us to know, okay? So so let me set it up like this, okay? Um, many of you know this if you're familiar with the Bible, but there were four different gospel writers. And when each of them would tell a story, each of them would sort of focus on that which was most important to them or the details that kind of stuck out to them in that story. Does that make sense? Okay, so for example, last night um, I went to a lacrosse game. I went to my son Jackson's lacrosse game, and there were like five families from our church that were at this lacrosse game. And if you were to ask each of them, hey, what do you remember from the game? Like what was important? Like it would all be true. They would all tell you part of it, but they would focus on different details that was important to them. Does that make sense? Okay. So when Mark and when Luke tell the story, they're like, here's how the story went down. Massive crowd climbed up on a roof, ripped off the roof, lowered down the dude in the middle of Jesus. When Matthew tells the story, I mean, just, just look at verse 1 and verse 2. Getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, let me just pause. Like what was most significant to Matthew or worth mentioning to Matthew or sort of the Holy Spirit through Matthew speaking out this truth. He didn't even mention like the roof. He didn't even mention the lowering him down. He didn't mention the packed out house and everybody like getting interrupted. There was something that Matthew was stunned by, and it's one word in there that I want you to see because I think it's important. It's in verse 2. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic. I think Matthew's pointing out that what moved the heart of Jesus was their faith together. Remember in the video clip, he pauses, looks up at the woman, he says, your faith is beautiful. And when he saw their faith, or let me just kind of make this clear, when he saw a group of people that were following Jesus together, fighting for their relationship with Jesus together, when he saw a group of people that said, we will stop at nothing to get our friend to the presence of Jesus together, when he saw faith together, Jesus was moved by that. And I want you to know that critical to following Jesus, all right, critical to our following Jesus as his disciples, is saying, I will follow Jesus with other people by my side that will be real with me and vulnerable with me and will challenge me and I'll challenge them. And when I'm straying from the faith, they'll pull me back. When they're straying from the faith, I'll pull them back because you're meant to follow Jesus in community. There is no such thing biblically as a personal relationship with Jesus Christ where it's you and Jesus, you alone, watching video clips, reading blogs, and having your own relationship with Jesus. Biblically, that does not exist. We are meant to follow Jesus in community. We're meant to follow Jesus with other friends in our lives that, by the way, are willing to rip open a roof and lower you down on ropes if necessary to be in the presence of Christ. You're meant to be real and vulnerable and walking with others. Do you see that? 
And I think there's a strategy of the enemy that happened pre-COVID, and then let me point out one that happened during COVID, okay? Pre-COVID, I think there was this pervasive lie that was rising up, particularly in America, which is you can do church, you can check your church box and do your religious following box by sitting alone in a crowd and being entertained by a church service worshiping and listening and then leaving and it's okay to be relatively unknown following Jesus and that's not true I think during COVID and this was necessary for a long time and for some of you even at home it's still even necessary now but there's been this lie that's sort of risen up that's been like you know what now I don't even have to be in a crowd I can just kind of sit at home on a couch with my coffee and get my church fix in for the week, and that's enough. And the kind of faith that moved the heart of Jesus is when two, three, four, five, ten people say, you know what, we're going to be in each other's lives. We're going to be honest with each other. We're going to push each other. We're going to follow Jesus. We're going to hold each other accountable. We're not going to let like sin and attitudes that are unhealthy rise up in each other. We're going to be part of the body of Christ. The church is called the body of Christ, meaning there's body parts that come together that look like Jesus and display Jesus together in the messiness of what it means to walk in community. Okay? In this church, we're not after church show woohoo we're after body of christ i know that's messy and that's why week after week after week we stand up and we're like we want you to be connected we want to get you in a group we want to get you serving on a team okay and i want to talk about one aspect of this and then and then we're going to move to by far the highlight of this teaching time which is a testimony okay but i want to talk about one aspect and then i'm going to transition this over okay um I'm a parent. Um, my wife and I are parents of four sons. We've now raised kids from babies to adult children, and we're feeling old, okay? And you need to know, um, like, we're passionate about our kids becoming functioning adults, okay? So in a way, and this will be important for later, we don't want to force them, and yet with all our heart we want to encourage and parent them that one day they need to have a job. So let's teach them and encourage them and help them build functional skills so one day they're responsible adults and go to their job, okay? Our kids have been gifted at sports. We don't want to force them to go to practice, and yet we want to encourage them, love them, be with them, do everything we can to help build into these gifts and talents that God's given them. We want our kids to fulfill their responsibilities. We want our kids to live all of life like as full-functioning adults. But can I tell you what we care about more than anything in this world? One day our kids will be around that crowd, every tribe, language, nation, and tongue on their knees saying, Jesus is Lord. And we want them to have a thriving walk with Jesus Christ. And the game changer, look at me, the game changer that we have seen is saying they need people in their lives that will rip roofs and lower ropes and, and challenge them and walk with them. They need voices besides just their parents that will walk with them as they walk towards Jesus. And so certainly I don't want to force them, but you better bet that Ashley and I will do everything in our power to encourage, love, shape, like guide them towards friendships where they'll walk with Jesus. I love beyond words that we have roots here at this church and we have Jensen Harper and a crew of others that disciple kids, help lead your kids towards Christ. It's one of the best things we have going on. I love that, that, that in our community, and we have leaders in this church that lead Young Life, that lead Impact, that lead FCA, that lead, you name it, rooted. There are possibilities beyond possibilities. And the absolute game changer that we have seen in our children's lives is getting them in a group of people 
over, like encouraging over and praying over and over. When their hearts are in hardened moments, praying over and over, getting people in their lives so that they can walk in community. And you want to know where it starts? Let me just be very real with you. They need to see their parents model it. Their kids are like, yeah, you want me to go to youth group, but you don't have people in your life that you care about, invest in, pour into, hold you accountable. They're like, why in the world would I need to? So here's a beautiful thing. Ready? COVID is this great reset. Like, like January every year, like New Year, new values, new goals, new resolutions. COVID, we are emerging out of COVID. And I think it is an awesome reset of our culture to say, what values do we want? What do we want to strive for? Whether your kids are three years old or 30 years old, how can you encourage them and how can you be the kind of person that says, when it comes to following Jesus, it's not just going to be our immediate family, and I'm not going to do it alone. I'm going to walk with Jesus with others. And so let me bring up now um, my son, my son Bennett. And he's going to, yeah, we can cheer for Bennett. Yeah. And I'm going to ask Bennett just to share a little bit of his story and his life and something that God has put on his heart uh, for our church. So I'm proud of you. You wildly followed Jesus and you lead many in the wake of how you do it. And just share, share with us um, what the Lord's been doing in you. Thank you, Dad. Yeah. So when I um, was listening to the story and reading over it myself, it's just the part about the group of friends being together and going after Jesus in full faith is what really stuck out to me because that's a big part of my testimony um, of when I truly encountered the Lord was when I was with my close group of friends and when we just boldly approached Jesus in full faith that he would do something. So uh, I guess I'll just tell a little part of my testimony. So I grew up in a decent home, you know. Yeah, okay. decent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And, like, I, I was just always around Jesus stuff. Um, life was good. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do alcohol. I uh, stayed away from the bad stuff, and I went to church. I kind of checked the boxes and did the good stuff. Um, but it, there's this verse in John, and it says, The thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy, but I come that they might have life and life abundant. And I didn't know what life abundant was. That's something I never really tasted because I didn't realize that life abundant was something you actually had to chase after. Like he has things that he wants to give you, but you got to go for it. So um, when I was in seventh, eighth grade, I met uh, my two best friends forever. Shout out Chaz and Caleb right here. And uh, we just started pursuing the Lord together. We started um, kind of going after him, and I had never really experienced um, this going after the Lord. It was more just step away from the bad things and not really step towards the good things. So um, we started going towards the Lord together, and my life just started changing little by little. And um, there, was this, there was this one night that really stuck out to me, and it was like a climactic point of my life and of my testimony. And uh, we were eighth graders, 14, 13 years old. Um, and we, Caleb just came back from a missions trip, and he was just on fire for the Lord, and he was saying, guys, I've just tasted of this more of Jesus that I've never really, like, I've never really tasted before, and I just feel like I want you guys to encounter that same thing, and we, we were hungry from his stories, and we were saying, yeah, we want that, so uh, the three of us that night, little 13, 14 year olds, we stood around in a circle, and uh, we just started praying, and we put on worship music, and we started worshiping, and literally just the Lord broke in and encountered us like we'd never um, known him before, and, and my life just took like a turn. Like I said, no longer can I just like walk kind of away from sin. Like I have to be pursuing Jesus with my full heart, and, and I found that easiest um, when, when I did two things. One was intentional to pursue Jesus with my full heart. Um, because, like, he's always just standing there behind me saying, just turn and seek me. And he's, like, he's saying, ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Like, we've got to seek in order to find. 
And then two, I just, I figured it was so much easier to do that when I was in community. So I joined youth group and, uh, well, I had been in it kind of before. I just never really liked it. But it says in the Bible that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. And, and so I just started looking at youth group as, well, I can encounter more of Jesus through youth group, so I got to go. Um, and I, I started to get discipled, and I'm still being discipled today. And um, the Lord just constantly is showing me new things and doing amazing things through me, giving me the bread of life every single day just because I'm pursuing him in that way. And just the friends have just changed my whole entire world uh, when it comes to that. And so I guess I'll just um, end with this. So about two weeks ago, um, we were worshiping and I was standing up here and I was just singing to the Lord and I felt like he said that he was just going to tell me something about the church. So I was like, okay, Lord, what is it? And so I just started listening, and um, I felt like God just gave me this picture of the direction that the church was headed. And I saw this train that was moving at an extremely fast speed, and um, it was in this dry uh, desert land. Like, the ground was all cracking, and uh, I saw from a bird's eye view that there was a green land that it was headed to, full of just um, growth and just green goodness, I don't know, like a feel of like a harvest, you know, and there was lines of people outside this train looking over at the Greenland saying, I want to get there, and everybody was trying to get on, but it was going too fast to get on, and I said, Lord, how are these people going to get on this train? It's moving so fast, like I want to get on, and I, and then I felt like he showed me another picture. He showed me this floating sword in the air, and then a hand reached out and grabbed it and just held on to it super tight, and I said, okay, God, what does this even mean, and I believe that the Lord was just kind of telling me, he was saying, this church is headed in this direction of so much growth and so much new goodness that you haven't even really experienced before. And the way that you're going to be able to get on this train and get on, you can't do it on your own strength. It's too fast. So you're going to have to grab on and hold tightly to the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and cling to it with everything you have. And just personally, I've found it's so much easier to do when we're actually in community. Like, we can grab on to what the Lord is saying and seek after it ourselves, and it's so good, and we should be doing that. But when we're together chasing it, like being disciple or with a youth group, when you can hold each other accountable um, and just push each, push each other as friends and as, as a church family and body, I've just seen it so much easier, and I want to go to this green land. I want to go to this new season where there's so much growth and goodness, um, and I just believe that's the direction the church is headed. So that's kind Amen. of Ben. Well said. <laughs> ben, why don't you uh, you just pray over our church. Pray that, that we would be um, a community, a family that experiences that. Just, just lift that up for us. Yes, Lord, we as a church family are so hungry for a move of God and a work of the Spirit. Um, So we just come before you humbly, Lord. And in Hebrews, you say um, that we can with confidence approach the throne of grace. So, Lord, we just come together as a church and we say we want this. We want to approach your throne, God, um, with confidence. So, Lord, give us this confidence to do that. And, and please be with us throughout the whole process. Show us what we need to do, Lord, and light our hearts on fire for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Ben. That's awesome. Hey, we're going uh, to close the service with worship and communion and, and praying for each other. So, so let's, let's enter into a moment now where we, where we worship the Lord and where we take communion. Communion is just a symbol where we say, hey, let's remember the body and the blood of Jesus. Like, let's remember that it's by his body that was broken and his blood that was shed. And when we take this bread, when we drink this, this juice, it's like broken body poured out blood for us to set us free. All right, so let's, let's take that if you're a follower of Jesus as we worship. Spend some time reflecting before the Lord and lifting up your heart before God. And then take communion. Um, And then when the moment's right, let's stand and let's worship the Lord. Let's worship him.
Let me pray for us. Jesus, meet us now. We, we take communion to commune with you. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for the story that, that is true, that you gave your life to set us free. And I pray, God, that, that if there's truths that you've stirred up this morning in hearts, that you would now give us the ability to make commitments before you, to be people that follow you in a way that moves your heart. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. When the moment's right.